Well, it's great to see such an interest in the earth sciences and the town of Dumberston, not just surficially, but, you know, way down in the bedrock. Okay, so where are we tonight? We're going to be looking at the geology of Dumberston, the glacial geology here. So now I guess it's time to have the lights off and see what develops. So we're going to take a look at the amazing geology of Dumberston, but not that only. We're going to go to some of the later history and look what the glaciers did to Dumberston. How about that? Oh yeah, this, this worked just a few minutes ago. <laughs> Some people were here. You saw this work, right? <laughs> there it is. There it is. Okay, so what was Dumberston like in the Ice Age? Well, I thought about this a lot when I was in Iceland a couple years ago. And I was sitting on a big ice block here along the shoreline of an Icelandic beach. And I do do tours with my wife, Suzanne, by the way. And if you wish to go to this beach and sit on your own iceberg, then our next one will be um, in two years, actually. We'll pull from this year. But we do go to Iceland and bring people to this incredible spot to look at glaciers and volcanoes and the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and all that stuff. Make sure you get on my email list if you are interested in these trips. But, hey, here we are. Dumberston would actually be 3,000 feet below a scene like this. If you were here about 20,000 years ago. So how long have your families been in Dumberston? <laughs> Is there any family history that kind of relates back to this type of environment? Well, some topics for tonight. How do we get glaciers? What types of landforms do they leave? What do glaciers do to Dumberston? And will the ice come back again? All right. To make a glacier, you need two things. At this point, I ask for hints from the audience. What two things do glaciers need? Water. Okay, well, that was pretty good. Most people say cold first, but they forget the water. But I think tonight, I heard water first and then the cold. But yeah, it has to be cold and it has to be snowy. That's exactly right. And to, just to make this point, there's a place that's really cold, but they've never had a glacier, and that's Fairbanks, Alaska. Isn't that something? Um, it's too dry. All right, so where does it get cold? Well, everybody knows that. If you're up at the high altitudes or the high latitudes, you're going to get cold temperatures. And there are two types of glaciers, basically, if we make it really simple here. The high latitude glaciers can uh, accumulate a huge amount of snow over a large area, and that's going to generate some ice sheets, otherwise known as continental glaciers. On the other hand, if you're up on a, on a mountain, a much smaller area, the mountain area will give you glaciers that start up in the mountains and then flow down the valleys. And so they have three names for the same thing. They're called mountain glaciers. They were first studied in the Alps, so they called them alpine glaciers. And they flow down the valleys, so they're also called valley glaciers. So if we talk about alpine or mountain or valley glaciers, we're basically talking about the same thing, more limited ice that's concentrated down those mountain environments. Okay, pictures of each. Here we have a picture from Alaska. And you can see how the glaciers kind of start high up in the mountains and just flow down. And much like a river system of water, these are river systems of ice. They have tributaries, etc., etc. So here they go, shaking the landscape. So that's the mountains, valley, or alpine types. Then we have the continental types, or the ice sheets. Here's a picture or a map of uh, Antarctica, and here is the cross section. And you'll notice if you look at the scale here, that's about 10,000 feet of ice. So 10,000 feet, and then much like a pancake, it will spread outward from the center areas of accumulation. So here's Dumberston. What kind of glacier do you think covered Dumberston and all of New England and most of Canada, etc., etc.? Continental, exactly. What a great group. You actually have answers to my questions. Very good. And the correct answers. So it was the continental glaciers or the ice sheets. That was what was here, just like this picture shows. Oh, and look, there's the answer. <laughs> and now, let's twist this around a bit and imagine what Vermont would be like if it was shaped by mountain glaciers. 
So, can you imagine looking around here from Dumberston? You say, oh, okay, some mountain peaks there, and look at where the glaciers came down. Now, the glaciers would be melted away today, of course, because it's now warmer, and so we would see things like this in Dumberston. This is Yosemite, <laughs> yeah, California. But these mountain glaciers create U-shaped valleys. You see, they concentrate their erosive forces right down the valley, and they, they kind of ream it out into this U-shape. So, we could find U valleys right here in Vermont. Now, just to show you that this is not totally fanciful, we do find some mountain glaciers that have shaped the White Mountains and also part of the Green Mountains. If you've driven around Vermont, you might have seen uh, U-shaped notches, and that's where a, either the Continental Glacier was just squeezing through there or a Valley Glacier was coming down out of the surrounding mountains after the Continental had melted away. You know, it was still cold enough to produce some mountain glaciers in the surrounding high areas. So Mount Washington does have, if you know your geology, they're called cirques, <coughs> that's the snow basins, C-I-R-Q-U-E, a cirque, a snow basin where the glacier would come down from the mountain and it creates these U-shaped valleys like you see here in Crawford Notch, New Hampshire. Well, where did the glacier begin? Where did it end? Let's go take a look at the map. If we look down on the North Pole here, here we have uh, Canada. You can see Hudson's Bay that's kind of sketched here under the ice and the Great Lakes. And here we are, like right over in that spot. Where's Cape Cod? There's Cape Cod right there. So that gives you a location. We're at the tail end of this big ice sheet. Look at it. It went all over northern Canada, coast to coast. And also note, we're all, we all think, well, some of us who think about glaciers, think about which way they flowed. So the glacier is kind of flowing south, but that's only right here. Over here it's flowing west. Over here it's flowing north. You see it kind of like I said a pancake before. You pour the pancake batter in the pan, and it flows out on all sides from the center of accumulation. And these ice sheets are kind of the same type of thing. So the glaciers keep flowing by gravity until something stops them. So what's going to stop them way out here? Are there big mountains way out here at the edge of this glacier? Any big mountains out there in Cape Cod that's going to say, stop, no more flow, the ice has got to stop here? Yeah, here we go. So it's the climate change. The sun's going to come out, we're going to warm things up. And what we have here is this, this fight between melting and ice flow. So when the glacier is advancing, there's more snowfall allowing the ice to go outward and it's cold enough so that the front of the ice doesn't melt away faster than it's coming down slope. You see there's this balance there. And so it's kind of like your checkbook that under these conditions you're getting more deposits than withdrawals and so your balance keeps advancing. On the other hand, when melting equals or is greater than ice flow, when the melting takes over, uh, see first of all we're just going to do equals, that's what's going to stop it. So if the melting rate equals the rate that the, the ice is flowing, then you're going to find that the ice front will no longer advance. Now please keep in mind, here's a detail that most people don't know. The ice keeps moving, the ice doesn't stagnate but it's just that the melting rate is equal to the flow rate. So the front of the glacier stays in the same position. So it stays in the same place and that has some important implications for the landform that's going to develop. The ice can just deposit its load right there at the front. And I'm going to explain that next. Um, here's a view of a valley glacier that shows that type of thing. Accumulation. The ice flows, then melting down here at the end causes the ice to stop, and look at all the material that's just dropped off the ice here when it was down a little bit further. Uh, this is uh, the picture that I'm thinking about is coming up shortly. Here, here's the end moraines, as they're called, that drop off the edge of the ice, and here it is. Making a moraine, when the melting equals the ice flow, it's like a conveyor belt. I brought some glacier ice with me tonight, but it 
turned into water today. <clears throat> so, if you want to make a moraine, you all heard about moraines, right? Those big piles of gravel that happen at the end of glaciers, and then the glacier melts away and leaves them behind. The glacier can be thought of as like a conveyor belt. And if the end of the conveyor belt stays in the same spot, then all the stuff being carried by the glacier, or the conveyor, just drops off the end and makes this pile. Here's our glacier. The ice flows. Everything within the glacier, it's called glacial till, by the way. That's the sediment that the glacier's carrying. And then it drops in this pile, and that's called the moraine. So moraine is made up of, out of till. And this is what glacial till looks like. Please note that there's no size sorting and no layers. It's just everything the glacier was carrying. <coughs> so there's sand, there's clay, there's boulders of various sizes that just drop out either at the end of the ice or maybe under the ice or at the side of the ice somewhere. This is direct ice deposition. Now, you got any stone walls here in Dumberson? How about your backyard? If you got stone walls, you are on tilt. Right? That's a field marker for glacial till. Because rivers don't bring those big stones, right? So it's not a river deposit, it's not a lake deposit. You're going to have the ice do that kind of carrying. Now sometimes, this is called basal till. Sometimes this will look just like cement, like gray cement. Basal till is till at the base of the ice. It's extra compacted because it's got all the ice on top of it. And it's got extra clay in it because the base of the glacier just grinds up the surrounding rocks into clay. So it's a mixture of clay and boulders and all pressed together. And literally, you can go up with a sharp pointed shovel and take all your might with the shovel, and the point will go in about a half an inch. And you'll get a sore, uh, sore shoulder when you do that a couple of times. Okay, the ice eventually melts away. That's called ice retreat. When the ice retreats, the melting rate is now greater than the ice flow. So once again, the ice keeps moving, you see, but it's just melting faster. To use your checkbook as an example, you are now in big financial trouble because you are spending more than is coming in. So that's what's happening here. Retreat. So it gets warmer, melting rate increases, greater than the ice flow, and the ice appears to go backwards. You know, if you were to see a time-lapse photo of a glacier that's in retreat, it actually looks like the ice is moving backwards, but it isn't. It's still moving forward, but it's melting faster than it's moving forward, you know, so it looks like it's moving backwards. But let's face it, folks, the ice can't go back uphill to Canada, right? <laughs> that's not going to work in the realm of physics. So it does not move backwards, it just melts faster. <coughs> Want to see some melting? Boy, rent this video. Maybe you've seen this. Uh, James Baylog, who did a, a, he's got actually two videos out. One is called Chasing Ice, and uh, National Geographic uh, sponsors his work. Amazing. We're on the Greenland ice sheet. There's a guy up there at the scale. This huge river is just running across the surface of the Greenland ice sheet. And it goes into a cavern and disappears into the bowels of the glacier. And then who knows where it comes out. Because that ice sheet, of course, is so big. How many people have seen this before? Have you seen James Baylog's work? Raise your hand if you've seen his work. Oh my goodness, look at that. Over half this audience has not done that. And you must do this. He's incredible. So once again, Chasing Ice. He's got another one called Extreme Ice. And it's James Baylog. Got to see this one. Amazing. Okay, getting back to New England. 20,000 years ago, the ice was down here. That's where that that terminal moraine is, uh, way down here, Long Island, Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, and then it went out to Georgia's Bank, but they cut that all off here on the map. But if we did not have the glacial deposits down here, there would be no Long Island. There would be no Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. In fact, there would be no Cape Cod, because that's also a moraine that's called a recessional one, if developed after the terminal one. But if you did not have the glacier, there would be tens to hundreds of feet of water out here. There's no rock under any of those places. But that makes for good beaches, right? Because when the glacier came, it brought all this sediment, gravel, sand, mud. Sand ends up on the beaches. We got some of the best beaches in the world out here, thanks to the glacier. As the ice is melting back, uh, this, by the way, 
they uh, actually locate Canoe Brook, and everybody from Dumberston knows Canoe Brook, right? Just downhill here. That's going to be an important uh, edge of Lake Hitchcock coming up in a minute. But there's Dumberston, so we're about halfway along Lake Hitchcock. This is Lake Hitchcock. That story's coming up shortly. But 20,000 years is where we're starting here. Then 18,000, the ice is right about here in central Connecticut, and there is a dam of debris across the Connecticut Valley. And this debris blocks the Connecticut Valley. And then the ice keeps melting, of course. And now, with that dam of debris, guess what's going to happen? We're going to have a lake. And so the lake gets started here. And then the ice has to keep melting and melting and melting for the lake to expand. So that's what happens. By 16,000 years ago, the ice is pretty close to central Dumberston right here, 16,000 years ago. And then by about 14,000, <coughs> way up in the North Country. And at that point, when it melts back just a little bit more, it opens a seaway right here. There's something called the Champlain Sea. And I think everybody who grows up in Vermont knows this, but you guys had the ocean up there in the St. Lawrence River Valley and squeezing into where Lake Champlain is now. You know that, right? They do teach you this in school, perhaps. They found whales up there in some gravel pits. So how did the whales get up there? You know, they had to swim in. And they didn't come up Lake Hitchcock, so they had to come in over there, down St. Lawrence River Valley. And, but you have to melt the glacier back far enough, you see, to get the ocean in there. So it's a great story, but you guys had a, an ocean way up here. So, if you were here in Dumberston, if the ice is melting by, this is what you might see. This is a picture, by the way, from the Canadian Rockies. This is ice right there. It's covered with glacial till. That's what's all the dark stuff. There's a couple of guys right there by this river. Of course, one in the foreground. Gives you some idea of the scale. So, this is what the glacier has done and is doing as it's melting away. Lots of melt water, of course. And the melt water, geologically, is going to give you this stuff called outwash. It's a gravelly, sandy mixture, but it's got layers. It's not like glacial till. In the outwash, anytime the river gets a chance to work on the glacial till, it's going to wash out the clay. So those fine materials that are clay, that's going to wash away, probably to a nearby lake, where it will settle out on the lake bottom. And it will leave the gravelly, sandy stuff behind in layers, so it will be layered. The ice will have scratched the bedrock, so has anyone seen scratched bedrock sticking up somewhere in your backyard, maybe, or on a, on a mountain top height? Scratched bedrock from the overpassing ice. And then we have all this glacial till stuff that's all over the place. And the ice, of course, is going to melt away and just disappear. When it does that, the till just drops down on the landscape, like you can see here with big boulders and this you know, clay and sand all mixed in as well. If you look the other way towards the mountains, more ice over here, some other people for scale. The river, of course, glacial till over everything. Sometimes it's just a thin coating, and sometimes it's much thicker. Right here in the valley, it's a fairly thin coating, and here's all the bedrock just sticking up with only a thin coating of till. But look here in the distance. Right there, we'll take a closer look. That's probably, oh, a couple hundred feet of distance there. And if you look at this, big mass of glacial till. <coughs> and you see any layers in it? <coughs> No, see, no layers, clay rich, just dropped by the ice. So glacial till is dropped by the ice, and that's how you get the stone walls. Okay, now let's take a look at some glacial lakes, because this is a pretty exciting thing in glacial areas. You find lots of lakes. So as the ice is melting away, think about how that's going to happen. The ice at first covers everything. Nothing in this town is above the surface of the ice. But when the ice is in retreat, melting back, it's also getting thinner. And when the ice gets thinner, then we can start to have some mountain tops exposed above the surface of the ice. And as it gets thinner, the mountains and the higher areas start to emerge from the ice. But the ice is blocking the lowlands. That's my point here. When the ice is melting away, but you have plugs of ice, like in the Connecticut River Valley and in some of the other streams that you have around here, in the lowlands, there's still going to be ice, then you're going to have lakes because the water tries to drain downhill, but there's ice in the way. So you're going to have lakes. So this happens time and time again. There might be big lakes, 
There might be small lakes. There might be lakes that only last for a year or two. But if your house, thinking about you and your situation here in Dumberson, if you have a lot of clay in your yard, or maybe a lot of sand in your yard, you may be on one of those temporary lakes. It usually leaves flat areas behind of some nicely sorted material like some sand, but there might also be some clay underneath, and you have to worry about that a little bit because if you have a septic system, hey, anybody have a septic system here? <laughs> Um, clay does not work well for a leach field. So there's lots of tricky things that the glacier can do to you, but getting lakes is a very scenic thing that you will find in glacial areas. So, as I just said, um, higher elevations will emerge, thick ice fills the lower areas, the result will be lakes, <coughs> and you might find some lake sediments, not glacial till. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, glacial well, let's take a look at Dumberston here. And here's a map uh, of surficial deposits of Dumberston, Vermont. And there's a reference on that somewhere, which I guess cut, cut off a little bit. But um, here's Black Mountain. Black Mountain, by the way, when you look at it, it looks like it's got a beautiful surf right here, a little circular place where a glacier should start. However, it can't be because it's too low in elevation and the surf is facing south. That's the worst place to get snowfall to last, right? So this just has to be the luck of the draw of erosion here. That's what happened. It's, it's not actually a glacial feature. Okay, so what do we have here? Um, here's the best place for you and your septic system. You want to look for glacial outwash deposits. See, coming down the valley here, here's this valley coming in to the Connecticut River, which is right along this edge. They didn't do anything in New Hampshire, so when you get that white spot right there, that's the, uh, the river <laughs> channel in New Hampshire on the right. But you can see that this coloration here is glacial outwash and deposits. That's nice gravels from streams coming out of the melting ice coming down these, these channels. And there's also some other gravels and sand. This is Lake Hitchcock stuff here. But that's the best place for your septic system when you can find those gravels. So, as the glacier melts, along comes the biggest lake that's filling the Connecticut Valley lowlands, and you all know that's Glacial Lake Hitchcock. So, in Glacial Lake Hitchcock, as it showed on one of the previous slides, it starts in central Connecticut, and then gradually, as the ice melts, makes its way up to northern New Hampshire and Vermont. And there's the Congregational Church, <laughs> uphill of the shoreline. And so, on this particular map, this is Dumberston once again. Here's that valley we just talked about. Here's where the Lake Hitchcock main park is right over here. And lakes are places of deposition because rivers go into lakes, right? So they bring all that sediment into the lake. So when we look at lakes, we find a couple of things along the shoreline. We find a lot of sand and maybe some gravel. Along the lake bottom, however, there's a lot of mud. And so that, that's clay, silt and clay. So that's very, very different from sand and gravel. And then when rivers come into lakes, we get deltas. And we'll take a look at those in just a second. But first of all, let's take a look at the, at the lake bottom. Glacial Lake Hitchcock is very famous. And in fact, Dumberton is extremely famous in the annals of glacial lake geology. Did you realize that? It's because there's a man from Tufts University, Jack Ridge, who's done a great job studying the clay deposits here. And he found fantastic clay deposits at Canoe Brook. And this big pile of clay at Canoe Brook has a lot of layers in it. Now this is from a year ago, uh, this is from years ago, so I'm not sure if the outcrop still looks like this today. But when you look at these clay deposits, they're layered. They're called varves, and varves are yearly deposits. So here's what a close-up looks like. There's a knife for scale there, and maybe the next one even shows it better. So there's a close-up, knife for scale. What you see is a dark layer and some lighter layers, and a dark layer and some lighter layers, and a dark layer. And the dark layer is very fine clay. That's the wintertime deposit. When the lake was frozen, and it couldn't be stirred up by any rivers coming in or wind, 
uh, churning up the lake water. When the lake is frozen in the winter, then the very fine clays can settle out onto the lake bottom. But during the spring and summer, the melt water is coming in and the wind is whipping everything up and the silty sand, maybe even some fine sand coming in. That's the summer layer. Then the next winter, more clay. Next summer, more silty sand. And so, what was discovered here is that you can count those pairs. Each pair is a year. So you can actually show and follow the growth of Lake Hitchcock by counting those layers. It's like tree rings, putting tree rings together into a chronology. So we have 4,000 years of unique deposits in Lake Hitchcock. So isn't that pretty cool? Now it took about 2,000 for the ice to melt back to Dummerton. So when you go down to Canoe Brook, you can only find at most 2,000 years uh, of, of layers. But um, the whole lake itself from central Connecticut would be a 4,000 year lake. So these are called varves, by the way. So you've now heard about varve clay and Canoe Brook and what makes Dummerston really famous in the annals of lake geology here at Lake Hitchcock. <clears throat> so if you take a look at what um, Lake Hitchcock might have looked like, here's a glacier in Alaska and melt water is coming out, a little bit of a delta right there, see that flat space? And it's actually a tunnel coming out of the ice right there, we'll talk more about that in a second. But look at how muddy the water is, and that mud would settle out onto the lake floor, and you get these layers of clay. Um, those are the varves. So that's what you find in the lowlands. You know that you're on Lake Hitchcock deposits when you get down into varve clays. And they're usually nice grayish colors, so you can pick it out pretty easily, you know, when you're there. When rivers, whether it's a small stream or a big stream, when they went into Lake Hitchcock, they would deposit their sandy gravels and mud to as a delta. So here's a big flat-topped area here. It's called a delta because of that Greek letter shape, which is the triangle, and that's a delta. So when people saw the Nile flowing into the Mediterranean, they named it the delta from that. But we find deltas as a very, very common feature up and down Lake Hitchcock. So big streams have big delta deposits into the lake. Smaller streams would have smaller ones. But the deltas are really important because that's a source of gravel pits into the lake. Um, it's a gravel resource. Deltas are really a lot of fun to look at if you go in and study them. But they have flat tops. Look at that with the streams coming out into the lake. But underneath the water, there's a very steep front here. The, the top part that's flat is called the top set beds of the delta. The frontal slopes are called the foreset beds. And they're at the angle of rest of sand and water. You know, it's about maybe 20 degrees or so. And if you go into a gravel pit, this is what you might see. This is the flat top beds created by the stream heading towards the lake shore. <coughs> but as the delta built out from a right to the left here, from the right to the left, see these layers here? Those are the foreset layers. And they tell you which way the stream came from. And they document the growth of that delta into the lake. So this is what a delta looks like in a gravel pit. There's some just beautiful examples up and down the whole Connecticut Valley. How many people might have seen that? Anybody seen that? As, as you drive around Route 91, sometimes you can look right into some of these gravel pits and see those tilted layers, and they're really pretty spectacular. And that's the shoreline, by the way, where the top set beds and the four set beds contact. That is the shoreline of the lake. And geologists go in and actually measure that elevation to find out where the shoreline was at any given spot. Okay, back to the surficial deposits of Dummerston here. When we get down to the Connecticut River Valley, this is what we find here. There's the short, the, uh, let's see, the gravels would be the shoreline deposits like of the deltas. So find any stream that's coming into the lake, and you'd probably find a delta right there. And a little bit further out, you have the, uh, the clays. So we got the, the sands and the silts and clays that are the, the lake bottom deposits. Um, now, you have a copy of this as a handout tonight. There was uh, some of them that were made anyway for the audience. But uh, I can give you, this is the, I can give you the reference to this so you can go online and find it yourself. This is the uh, Vermont surficial, that's surface, not bedrock, surficial geology map. 
And most of Dummerston here is covered by this brown layer, which is glacial till. So when you look around, you find direct deposits of the ice would be the main thing that covers Dummerston. The red is bedrock. So that's exposed or almost exposed bedrock. So look at that. I would say that's number two for what you find here at Dummerston. Lots of bedrock that's either at the surface or just barely under the surface. And then we have some of the greenish blue areas that are called caves and outwash deposits. That would be the meltwater. Caves are places where you're right near the ice that's melting and you get meltwater. So it's basically all outwash deposits. Whoa, who's getting bored by all of this? <laughs> you know, the ice is melting, you've got a lot of gravels getting washed out. That's the best place for your house, by the way, because this gravelly stuff is where the landscape tends to be a bit flatter and you can get groundwater a bit easier because it's gravelly. You can also get your septic systems in a bit easier because it's more porous, but that also means that your neighbor's septic system could also get into your morning coffee. You've got to watch out for that. <laughs> so, uh, follow any of these channels, and this is where there was milk water going down the stream system on its way to Lake Hitchcock, and it just left all of those gravelly outwash deposits up and down the stream. And if you remember what I said about the melting ice, when the ice is melting away, see, this could have been a, a blockage right here. There would be ice all across this part of the valley, and the upper part of the valley would be a place for a lake to get trapped, and the ice would melt would melt a little further and the lake might extend. So this is probably a spot where there could be some clay also just because a temporary lake could have been there trapped by the melting ice. Okay, let's go uh, through some other glacial landforms here. Glacial erosion landforms is scratched and polished bedrock and there's something called a roche moutonnée. <laughs> You've all seen scratched and polished bedrock at some point. But let's go on to the Roche Moutonnet. The Roche Moutonnet from the French meaning sheep rock. And if you take a look at the hills surrounding all of New England here, you tend to find this shape, gentle on the north and steeper on the south. A little gentle on the north and then steeper on the southerly side. That's a general shape. The, the ice was going right over the top of those hills. And when it did that, When it did that, it smoothed the upglacier side. The side that's facing the advancing ice got smoothed like running some sandpaper against a board. It's going to smooth off. But on the downstream edge, there is actually something called plucking going on. This piece of the mountain is going to be attached to the ice and it's going to pull away. And that's going to go bouncing away. And again. <laughs> So, we tend to lose pieces by plucking on the south side, but we have abrasion on the north side, and so you tend to get this very uh, consistent shape of, of many mountains, and that's called a roche moutonnet. Well, where do we have it in the region here? That was out in Northfield, Massachusetts, not too far away. But if you take a look at this hill across the river from Brattleboro, and how do you pronounce that one? Fantasticate, is it? Uh, if we take a look at one Tasticate, this is going to be on Brattleboro TV. People are going to write me and complain about my pronunciation, I'm sure. But in any event, folks, if you take a look at this, here's Brattleboro, here's the mountain. But if you know about contour lines, when the contour lines on a map are close together, that's a steep slope. When they're not so close, it's a bit more gentle. So look at this slope right here, and then you look on the other side of the mountain, and it's not quite so steep. So you come on the north side, not quite so steep, across the mountain top, and then drop all along there. There's the cliff. So take a look at Daniel's Mountain. Not so steep here, but then you get to the southerly side, very steep right there. So that general shape is what we call a roche moutonnet. Let's take a look at something else now. How about some glacial deposition? Eskers and drumlins. Well, when you look at ice, ice is going to melt, and many times the melt water is going to come through tunnels through the glacier and then come out at the front. There will be ice tunnels. Well, here's one in Alaska, and there's a guy up there with brown hands. 
So there's about a 30-foot hole with a river coming out of it. Now, rivers carry gravel. And so, there's going to be gravel all up in that hole, way up into the ice. There's going to be a river channel of gravel. And that's going to be what a landform we call an ester. And here's one in Northfield, just to show you what this looks like. In West Northfield, not too far from the Vermont border. When you melt the ice away, then the gravel that was in the tunnel, remember the tunnel with the river that's got the gravel? Well, the gravel will not melt. The ice around it will melt, but the gravel remains as a hill on the landscape when you melt away the ice. So that's what we have here. We find that this is a curving ridge, which was the, the uh, old stream channel that was in the ice. And that's called an ester. And then we have a delta, because where did the river go? The river went into Lake Hitchcock. So it built a delta, which is now a big gravel pit there. Along Route 142, I bet you've all driven by there. And then we have remains of the ice, which are little lakes here that are called kettle holes. And, and this is a map of the area. There's the esker. This is the delta top. There's the kettle holes there and there and there. So that's the geological map of the area. So this is what we had. Also through here, if these, um, these tunnels would have been in many of the river valleys. And today, in Vermont, you find esters like this one that are going down the river channels, and there's, uh, th there's a number of examples of that. Another landform is a drumlin. Drumlins are deposited underneath the moving glacier. So when the glacier moves, it takes the till that's underneath the ice, and it tends to pile it up in a certain way, and then shape it as it continues to move. The shaping is as follows. It is steeper on the north side and more gentle on the southerly side, the down glacier side. Okay, and now you might remember the Roche Moutonnet. Okay, that was only a couple of minutes ago, folks. How are you doing? <laughs> so, the Roche Moutonnet was steep on the up glacier, oops, down glacier side. Oops, let's get that right. The Roche Moon today, because of the plucking on the down glacier side, was steep on the down glacier side. And it was smoothed, abraded, on the up glacier side. And that's due to erosion. So that's a bedrock hill due to erosion. This is a depositional hill. It's made up of glacial till and has the opposite shape. It's steeper on the up glacier and pushed and streaked out on the down glacier side. So it's got the opposite shape. This is a great test question yes. in Geo 101, is to compare and contrast those two things. So this is due to deposition. It's got the opposite shape. The other one is due to erosion, and it's on bedrock, and it has the opposite shape of a drumlin. So Roche Moutonnets versus drumlins. OK, you remember drumlins. That was just a few seconds ago. <laughs> drumlins can be found in Dunderston. Yes, folks. Look at this and see if you can find kind of an ovoid shape that is lined up by the flow of the ice in the direction of the flow of the ice. Look at that hill right there. Look at this hill right here. So there's a whole bunch of these in the Connecticut River Valley area, by the way. So drumlins are, are common. And they're made up of, once again, glacial till. OK, and now for some final topics. How about a concretion? And will the glacier come back again? You know about concretions because in the clays of Lake Hitchcock, you can sometimes find these things. Now, this is an exposure in the Connecticut River by, taken by divers 15 feet below the surface. These little circular rocks are coming out of the clay layers. And there's one on display, and there's some sketches that you can see there. Um, these are, con once again, called concretions. And here's what happens. You have the clay layers of Lake Hitchcock, clays and silts and clays and silts and clays and silts. And now, groundwater is going to penetrate along those layers. And the thing about groundwater is it will have minerals within it. 
And if you've ever seen the water that drips off your faucet and then and your bathtub perhaps, you've ever seen minerals that are coming in there? Okay. So anyway, the groundwater in the, in the ground coming along those layers has some minerals, particularly in this case, calcium carbonate. And the calcium carbonate, much like what happens in a pearl, starts to have some deposition at some point. It starts to crystallize at some point, who knows why. But it starts at some point. And then it's the, that kind of attracts the same minerals to go around and around and around it. So it's like a, a center of precipitation. And then it grows from there. And so this is what we have here. For some reason, there was a center that started to have the, the precipitation process. And then it grew round and round and round. There was another one right there. And in this case, they grew together. So you can get all sorts of weird shapes as they grow and perhaps intersect one another. So look for these. In fact, let me ask, how many people in this room have found concretions or at least seen them before? And that's not that many. Uh, Putney is a famous place, by the way, that has two-toned ones as, as you go down towards the river. Some of those ravines that cut towards the river, you find the clay layers of Lake Hitchcock that are weathering away. And look for what's weathering out of those clays. They're, they're kind of... Um, spotty in their occurrence. When you find them, you tend to find a whole bunch, but then you can go for a half a mile or a mile and just not find any at all. Once again, concretions. Now, um, as I said, life is an oyster's pearl. Rock by groundwater can concentrate. Sedimentary material can become rock. But let's look at some. This is not Lake Hitchcock. <laughs> but if you're out on the Northern California coast, look at those round balls there. Those are concretions that have weathered out of the surrounding cliffs. You can see some of them hanging up there. Why are they so round? Uh, they're round for the same reason a pearl is round. You start at a spot, a center, and then as the material comes through in the fluid, it just precipitates all around that surface. And so, once again, concretions from the Oregon coast. But those are bigger than the uh, Connecticut Valley ones. The Connecticut Valley ones tend to be flat because look at the layers here. See, they're, they're forming right along these flat layers. So they don't build so much round as disc shape. OK, so here's a Lake Hitchcock shoreline mystery. Shoreline should be level. You ever go swimming in a shoreline and you don't find that you uh, have to fight the current? You know, the lake is kind of level, not really moving along. Well, if you did a plot of the elevation of the Lake Hitchcock shoreline in Vermont, this is what we find. If you're down here at the Massachusetts line, the elevation of the shoreline is around oh, 300 or so um, feet above sea level. If you come up to Brattleboro, you're about 400. Come up to Gummerston, you're around 450. But look at this, you go all the way up here to northern Vermont and you're about 1,000 feet above sea level. We have a shoreline that is tilted. How do you get a tilted lake? That's weird. It's a good one to canoe on, though, if you start up in the morning. <laughs> OK, well, obviously, you can't have a tilted lake because the water would drain out. So something had to happen after the lake drained. And this is what happened. And this tells us something about the Earth that I bet you never would have guessed. And that is, we're living on the Earth's crust, and the Earth's crust, like the surface of a balloon, will go up and down as you put a weight on it. If you put a weight, like a glacier, on the Earth's crust, which tends to be around 20 miles thick, by the way, mostly granite and relatives of granite, you put a weight on that 20 mile thick granite crust, and it's actually going to push the granite down into that squishy layer underneath called the mantle of the Earth. And when you remove that weight, in other words, melt the glacier, then it's going to rise back up again. Well, when we had the glacier, here we go, there's the glacier. So we have a glacier, the glacier pushes down, it depresses the land, and then when the glacier melts away, there's a low spot, in this case, they put a shallow <coughs> sea in there with a beach. This would be kind of like what's happening up at the Hudson's Bay right now, because you know, the shoreline up at Hudson's Bay is going to be around 1,000 feet above sea level if you could just live long enough to see it. It's going to rebound that much. So here we had the lake, Lake Hitchcock. Let's put the lake in there. And then, because of rebound, 
we find that the old shoreline is now uplifted because of the rebound. So the ice rebounds more, well, excuse me, the land rebounds more to the north because the ice was thicker in northern Vermont than it was in southern Vermont, you see. So the depression of the Earth's crust is proportional to how thick the ice was, how much the weight was. So that's why the shoreline has a tilt. There is more rebound to the north, less to the south. Okay, another thing that you may not have known about ice ages is this. The present day shoreline is right here, but during an ice age, here's the ice age coastline. It's basically along the outer edge of the continental shelf. So if we come up here to New England, there's Cape Cod, the outer edge of the shelf is uh, over 100 miles offshore. So if you think it's a long drive to the Cape, man, it would have been much longer at this time. <laughs> You're way out here. But if the ice sheets melt, then the coastline in the future is going to be way up here. So you have that land in Florida? <laughs> Sell it. <laughs> Okay, and uh, one of the last things to cover tonight is, will there be another glacial advance? Yes. Let's go on. Okay. <laughs> okay, why will there be another glacial advance? And that is because, look at a two million year history of the Earth's climate. Here's glaciations over on the left, and the warmer interglacials on the right. Ignore everything else that's on there. <clears throat> but look at this, cold, warm, 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 very cold, very cold. And then this was our last glaciation at its maximum around 20,000 years ago. And there we are right now, who knows, you think it's going to stay warmer, warmer, warmer? I'm going to bet it's going to stay warmer, warmer, warmer for a while. But in any event, uh, we are not out of this ice age cycling. And we will just not be out of this in the foreseeable tectonic future of the world because of this next picture. Map of the globe, looking down at the North Pole. Where are most of these continents? We're wedged right up at the North Pole. Where does it get cold? High latitudes, right? And so, it is quite likely that we are just going to be naturally into a cold environment here. Um, because of our geographic setting. So, I think we're going to have another ice age. I mean, what's changed over the last two million years from, oops, uh, from this? You know, we haven't changed much from where we were two million years ago. So I think we're in this cycling. And I think the answer is yes. Okay, so a quick review. We have seen how the ice has changed landscapes. You've seen a lot of the evidence, erosion, deposition, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Lake Hitchcock, and so forth. And this is a great place to live, of course. Great place to study geology, the best in the world, I think. And that's Dummerston. You guys are here. But don't clap just yet because I have something else to show you. <laughs> Tonight. I brought something called a stereoscope. Here you can see it on uh, my outdoor glass table. That's what all this is, so ignore, no, ignore the hole where the umbrella goes. <laughs> <laughs> but look at this funny thing with legs here. There's two of them on the back table. And I have the stereoscope pictures here. And they're, they're um, in this case, a picture of a glacier in Alaska that's coming down to the ocean. And there's a delta right there. Now, this is the scenario that we had in the Connecticut River Valley. So if you think of this as Lake Hitchcock and the melting glacier and a river coming off the mountainside and the ice and building a delta, well, there it is. So you can see this in 3D because when you put your eyes up to the eyepieces here and here and you put the photos underneath, your eyes will be directly down on the photos, and you can jiggle the photos just a little bit back and forth, and when they are in position, boom, everything will pop up. And it's really pretty cool. So I brought this picture. There's a close-up. Just in case you don't get a chance to do this. There's only two stereoscopes, and there's a lot of people. But this is what you would see. There's the delta. Look, see the river channels going across the top of it? There's the shoreline right along there. 
And here's the ice. But I also brought another one, drumlins and esters in Canada, along with kettle holes. And this is pretty neat. Each one of these, you see the grain of the picture here? Okay, see if you can tell me which way the glacier went. If that's a drumlin, that's a drumlin, that's a drumlin. Where's the steep side? You think it's right there? Yeah. And right there? I think so too. And it's more gentle on this side. So, the glacier went. Let's see how good you are. Did the glacier go from the right to the left or the left to the right? If you think it went from the right to the left, vote now. Any votes back there? I'm going to vote that way. Okay, it's unanimous. <laughs> right to left. Steep side faces up glacier on a drumlin. So these are all the drumlins. Look at that. Just amazing. And then, look at this. It looks like maybe a road network. But this is an esker. So as the ice was melting away, there was a huge tunnel within the ice carrying the melt water. And there's gravels in the tunnel. And when the ice melts away, the gravels form this little curving ridge. But that's that's a cast, so to speak, of a uh, stream that was in the key ice. So the ice tunnel position, we're going to go. And there's uh, one right there. And you can probably see a bunch of other ones, little sections right in there. So you find these all over Vermont also. If you look at topographic maps, you will see these. And those are the gravelly eskers. And then the kettle holes, these are places where the ice just got buried and melted away and left a hole filled with water. So, this is up in Canada. You can see this in 3D also. There's a close-up. And not pictured tonight, I also brought the moon with craters on the moon. Those have nothing to do with Dummerston and glaciers, but they're kind of neat to see under the stereoscope if you want to see a lunar crater. Okay, and now I told you about our DVDs and videos that are for sale. And now you can also join us for our fantastic landscapes tours. Oh boy, I'm going to get some TV. You're going to edit this one out, right? <laughs> free publicity for tours, thank you very much. Uh, come with us to any of these great places. We have a wonderful time taking people around with small groups. And we're going to go back to Iceland again in 2015. And thank you very much. Thank you. are extremely hard. If anybody would like to get up and stretch before you sit back down again, that's great. I'll, I'll take a couple of questions and then I'll just be up here to answer questions. And maybe if someone could turn the lights on, that would be great. Okay, so how many questions do we have tonight? So I see one and two. That's a great number. So let me start here at the front. Say it loud. I do not. Okay, the question is what about Drumlin pictures from Dumbertson? I do not have Drumlin pictures from Dumbertson, but Drumlins are typically about a mile or less in length, and they might be 50 to 100 feet tall. So they are not really huge. And they're very smooth. When you look at them, they've been shaped by the glacier, and so they tend to have this smooth outline. And it's oriented in the direction of the glacier flow, so basically it's a more subtle trend. Yes, ma'am. Um, a time when it's cold enough 
to create glaciers. So this is not unique. Okay, yes. When the dam broke for uh, Lake Hitchcock, was that something that happened over like thousands of years or did it literally like break like a beaver dam like all of a sudden and then yeah. the water just went? Yeah, that's a great question because you would think that whenever there's a lake, the question was, what about the drainage of Lake Hitchcock? How did Lake Hitchcock drain? And I remember that uh, when I first, you know, came here years and years ago and was learning about Lake Hitchcock and the dam and all that, I had this great image about, oh, the lake just draining out in a day and having a huge flood and all that. Well, here's the latest on that that's developed over the last uh, decade or so. And it turns out that when you melt glacier ice, the sea level rises. And when the sea level rises, but because of the weight of the glacier, the land is still depressed, it turns out that central Connecticut, where the dam was, was right about at sea level. So there was no big dam there to break. So there was an obstruction, but it was pretty much right at sea level. So when that broke, it was a much more gradual process, because the land is rebounding, and that's what's kind of, it's almost like a bottle tipping the water out of the lake. So it was not a big flood. So if you go to Long Island Sound, you do not find some huge flood deposit there. So it was a more gradual draining rather than a big flood. Okay, a couple questions back here, if you don't mind sitting through some more. Yeah, please, please, go ahead and do that. Yeah. I was just, I was interested in, oh, you? No, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm his wife. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whining at him. I have a. I've never been able to wrap my head about glacial flow because, yeah, because I mean, a glacier is made out of ice. To me, having experienced it, ice is as hard as rock. So how is it that gravity works on a glacier and actually? moves it. I, oh, yeah. I don't get it. You know, there's a great video that I saw on this once, and they, they took a, a cylinder of ice, and they put it in a press, and at the base of the press, there was a hole at the base. Uh, so the water, the ice was being compressed by the hydraulic press, and it was just squeezing right out of the hole at the base. Does, so, it, does it raise the temperature as well, that pressure at the bottom? Uh, well, let's see, let's see. The, a lot of pressure. Yeah, the, there's pressure, but pressure and temperature don't necessarily equate one to the other. So the, let's just, uh, there's, there is melting, at, there is pressure melting at the base of a glacier, because if you actually put ice under pressure, it raises the melting point. No, what is it, the other way? Lowers the melting point? Uh, it makes it melt anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it lowers the melting point, so now it's able to melt. Yes, you're playing itself. People realize that. If it yeah. wasn't for that, we wouldn't have hockey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in any event, that's that's really important. So anyway, to get back to your question, we've got a glacier. For the top part of the glacier that's not under much pressure, the ice is very much brittle, much like smashing an ice cube <coughs> with a hammer, it's going to be brittle. If you're walking on a glacier, this is very dangerous because as the ice is moving and it's brittle at the surface, it's going to crack. Think about walking over the surface of a giant loaf of bread. You know, the cracks that happen as you get the expansion on the top of a loaf of bread. Uh, how many people have walked on the top of a loaf of bread? <laughs> okay, I think I'm running out of good analogies. Right? But in any event, you all know about crevasses, right? So when you're walking across the surface of the ice, you're going to perhaps be at risk of falling into a crevasse. How far are you going to fall? Turns out you're only going to fall about 150 feet. Because with 150 feet of overlying weight of the glacier, the ice becomes plastic. And so crevasses don't go thousands of feet or hundreds of feet. It's only like 150, but that's enough to kill you, of course. But when you fall in, you will be now enveloped in ice and, and carried by the glacier. And there have been actually many examples of climbers that have disappeared and then decades, or maybe even over 100 years later, they now appear at the front of the glacier and are seen by lots of people. You know, so, 
that does happen. Okay, yes. Uh, I just had the uh, terminal moraine, which created Long Island, right? Is the terminal moraine created Long Island? So I was wondering, I mean, we can obviously see Long Island and see the evidence of all that, but all that material, how far away did it come? And, and is there like a negative uh, image of that material somewhere to the north? Oh, yes, absolutely. So the, the question basically is, uh, where did all that material come yes. from that's now down on uh, the coastal areas and even here in, in Vermont? Well, has anyone ever been to northern Canada, up where the center of the ice sheet was? It's called the Canadian Shield. Very few people go up there. But if you've been there, tell me what it looks like. You know? Is there like bare rock? I've seen lots of pictures of it. I've never been there myself. But it's, there's a huge zone up there because the ice is forming there and then it's flowing out. So it's like a consistent erosion, erosion, erosion. And so all the soil has been stripped off. It's bare rock all over the place. And, um, and that's the eroded part that went further south, you know, east, west, and north, you know, from that central part. So that's, uh, that's where a lot of uh, our soils come from, is from, from Canada. So they lost, we won. Is that Hudson's Bay? Uh, yeah, Hudson's Bay would, would be up near the center of that flow. Mm -hmm. Yes? So talk a little bit about global warming, the melting of the Arctic, the rising of the oceans. Where do glaciers fit into all of that? Well, we're in, we are in an interglacial time now. Um, and people worry about global warming, but you know, 20,000 years ago, which wasn't that far back on a geological time scale, we were under 3,000 feet of ice here, and the ice was way down at Long Island Sound. So talk about global warming. You know, we've had a lot of global warming. And the thing that is stupid about humans is to think that the ice is uh, going to be stable and the climate's going to be stable, because look what's happened in 20,000 years. It hasn't been stable at all. Sea level has gone from the outer part of the continental shelf during the Ice Age to, with the melting that we have, up about uh, oh, uh, 200 or 300 feet, 400 feet compared to where it used to be. And it's got another 200 feet to go if we melt off all the ice. And that's going to put seawater uh, up here in the Connecticut River, probably right up to Dunstan. Anyone know what the elevation is of the Connecticut River in 230? 230, there you go. Okay. Seawater, right out there. Yep. So you guys would be the shoreline. Hey, talk about property values. Uh, so anyway, uh, the, I think the I think the the verdict is pretty much in on global warming that we've got it. I don't think that we can do anything about it. I'm, I may be wrong on that count, but there's so much inertia in the amount of CO2 that's going in to the atmosphere. And um, ooh, I don't know. So, if you've read the stories on it, you know, we start to melt off the permafrost, and you get methane. Methane is what is it? Something like 20 times better a greenhouse gas than CO2. You start melting off the permafrost, my God, that's going to be a tremendous belch of methane going into the atmosphere. And so I think we need to be prepared as, as a global community of human beings here to move um, away from the ocean. Where? You just keep coming. Well, it's going to get warmer in Canada. Right. So, maybe. Can we also uh, well, I hope so. They've got uh, they've got medical plan out there. You know? <laughs> okay, what else? Uh, yes, sir. No, yeah, what about the Scutney train? Say that all oh, the uh, the Boulder train. Yeah. Yes. 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 Oh, that's a that's a really good story. Thank you for asking that one. But how can you figure out where a glacier has gone or is going? Well. I should say, has gone. Where has the glacier gone? You can look at scratches on the bedrock, uh, but the scratches pretty much tell you where the latest glacial movement was, because as the ice gets thinner, it can actually change its, its direction. So somebody came up with an idea, um, and this is well reported in the literature, that if you take a mountaintop of, uh, of a rather unique rock type like Mount Escutney, which is a type of granite that's very poor in quartz, 
like most granites have a lot of quartz, but escutney doesn't. So there's Mount Escutney. The glacier's coming across Mount Escutney. And so as it picks up rocks from Mount Escutney, think plucking, if you would. Remember, mountain top getting plucked. Those boulders and pebbles and whatever are going to go out, and they are going to form a depositional pattern that's going to lead right back to Mount Escutney. So you can see just where the ice went and how it moved. So it's called a boulder train. That's the boulder train. Is that the same phenomenon that did you have like a Peggy's Cove in Nova Scotia where the boulders are just sort of piled, and sometimes a boulder on a boulder? And oh, well, I don't think that's the same type of thing because the boulder on top of boulder is just the way they melt out. It's just the luck of one coming down. They just crop. Yes, yeah, so they have balanced boulders sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Most of the really good ones are gone, thanks to college kids. <laughs> Uh, yes. Um, the, in general, the movement of the glacier across this part of the world was north-south. Is that? That's the general direction. Right. You showed the picture of it sort of spreading out from the central, but we were still far enough north, so the glacier was coming essentially what we would say down. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Where exactly is the canoe broken pit? And can you go there and look? Uh, you know, I have been there, but I've only been there once. And uh, it's down near the Connecticut River. It's in the lowlands near the river. And there's uh, somebody from Dummerston can, can tell you that. <laughs> Does anybody know? Which one? Is, is the Canoe Brook uh, Clay Pit? Is it oh, the clay it's clay right clay. opposite the uh, Waterman's uh, Stick Plant there, you know, mm -hmm. where he makes the stakes? Across the road. Well, Go to the Randy Farm, you know where the Randy Farm yeah. is, and um, north, keep, keep going north, and it's the next depression where there's a brook, and it's a big gully, and on the north side of that brook, you look down to the right, and you'll see there's been a, uh, well, they've been excavating in there, they, the um, clay court uh, tennis people were taking stuff out of there for a while. And Sir Sosimo was going to operate a, an, an operation there to make clay for capping um, trash. Oh yeah, landfills. Land that, that, that's a big call for yeah, clay but these it, days. The town here didn't go along with that too well, so it didn't happen. <laughs> but anyhow, that that's a big clay area. There's a big clay area in my brook, which is the next <coughs> one to the south. Mm -hmm. The whole thing is all lined. Yeah. Uh, how about uh, concretions? Do you find concretions there? I haven't seen any. Yeah, because there are no concretions that I know of in Canoe Brook either. Yeah. But where you find them, you know, they, they tend to be pretty numerous. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you know just a little bit of this geology, just then you can trace the same yeah. patterns up and down the whole Connecticut Valley, you know, the deltas, <laughs> the clay. And then as soon as you get above Lake Hitchcock, by the way, you're on glacial till, so you start to see stone walls. So that's another thing. No stone walls on Lake Hitchcock deposits because that's all river deposits or lake deposits. You know, it's not glacier ice deposit. So, so if we have stone walls, if you have stone the lake walls, didn't come there. you're up above the lake shore and you're on glacial yeah. till. <laughs> so how long did Lake Hitchcock exist? Lake Hitchcock existed for 4,000 years. And we can say that so dramatically because those, of those VARVs. Each VARV is a year, so it's like a great calendar count. And they've done a lot of work over, well, probably almost the last uh, eight years, almost 100 years now, just, you know, plotting those together. And uh, it's an amazing story, and it's really well presented. And the thing that is really important is on some of those layers, you'll get some carbon-14, some, some organic material to get a carbon-14 date. See, so as soon as you can get a carbon-14 date, yeah. then you now not only have 4,000 years, but you have 4,000 years that you can count back to, you know, 18,000 uh, BC. <laughs> how, how thick would a year be? It depends. I, I know yeah, it's it, a it question, is. but, but some, an some of them are the size of your finger, okay. and some of them are three feet. That's fine. Uh, it depends on how close the glacier is. If you're really close to the ice front, there's going to be a lot of meltwater coming in over the course of a summer, which could give you, you know, that much of a summer deposit. Do you know this particular one? This I've been to Canoe Brook once. And so do you know what those layers are? Uh, yeah, we saw some pictures there. I can go back so there. 
like but, but, but they're, they're about like this. And that's one year. So that must be to be thousands of years. It's got to be thousands of these. That's got to be yeah. pretty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very, very, it's very interesting. And the ones on the top of the pit are very small, and the ones at the bottom of the pit are older, and the ice was closer, you see. So okay. the ones at the bottom of the pit are, let's say, about that big, and the ones at the top of the pit are more like that. Mm -hmm. So you can see that change. Because the more the ice melts back, the harder it is to get sediment to, to canoe work because the ice is farther away. Oh, you've been a great audience tonight, and I'll be glad to stay here as long as you have questions.